I V M. Hello and welcome. This is Govind Raj Jethi Raj presenting to you the latest segment of Business Dot Next on Bloomberg Quint. Jason Jennings is a researcher and one of the most successful and prolific business and leadership authors in the world. His Wall Street Journal, USA Today, Business Week, and New York Times bestsellers include books like "It's Not the Big That Eat the Small, It's the Fast That Eat the Slow," and more recently, the well-known book "The High Speed Company," which tackles the subject of creating cultures of urgency and growth that are able to compete in a nanosecond world. One of the interesting points about Jason and his researchers is that they've screened and studied more than 220,000 companies from all over the world. He's an authority on leadership, growth, speed, and innovation, and he loves telling a good story. Jason Jennings, uh, hello to you. Ah, uh, Govan, it's great to be with you. Namaste. Right. And uh, let's start with the High Speed Company. It's the most recent book that you've written. What prompted you to title this book the High Speed Company, as opposed to earlier books, which you had looked at different aspects of management and managing? Well, uh, I always have a research team around me uh, as we're working on a book. In fact, we we never really title a book. Uh, until sometime during the research when we come across uh, a big finding. And it just became obvious to us that there were a small group of companies around the world who are able to get everything done much more quickly than anybody else, but they're not only able to do it once or twice, they're, they're, they're able to do it on an ongoing basis. And so these were the companies our research identified, we got inside, we studied, we generated about 100,000 pages of interview transcripts, and the purpose of that book, The High Speed Company, was to reveal the secrets of, of those companies that just move faster than everybody else. Right. And in your research, you've thrown up very diverse examples. You've looked at big companies like Procter & Gamble. You've looked at small companies uh, like Mohawk Industries, J.M. Smucker, Harris Corp, Goodrich. So, you know, it's very diverse. And some of these brands are known to us sitting in countries like India, and some of them are not. Yes. Uh, can you tell us what ties these companies together? Uh, I can tell you what constitutes um, a high-speed company. But let me begin, um, Govan, by saying that speed... For the sake of speed, I don't necessarily, even though I've written a couple of books about speed, speed for the sake of speed is not necessarily good. You you could be in a car careening out of control and get yourself in in grave difficulty. What we discovered inside truly fast companies uh, are, are, are four basic things that they share that allow them to be faster than everybody else. Number one is they share a single purpose. And note, I did not say a single vision statement or a single mission statement. Truly high-speed companies have little time for lofty vision statements and vision statements. They have a single purpose. For example, the world's only global furniture brand, IKEA. They don't exist to sell furniture faster than anyone else. They exist to improve the lives of the many faster than anyone else. So there's a single purpose. Everybody in the organization understands what the single purpose is. Number two, there is complete alignment around that purpose. Imagine the power, uh, Govan, of everybody in the company uh, picking up a bow and arrow and shooting at the exact same target. These uh, high-speed companies do not tolerate people who are not aligned around their purpose. Number three, and, and this goes in the face of everything that everybody's ever been taught in business schools and everybody has ever come to believe in business. But in truly high-speed companies, everyone has access to all the information. I recall sitting with Charles Koch, uh, the CEO and the founder of Koch Industries, which is the world's first or second biggest privately held company, depending on the reporting year. Generally, they're number one. They do about $120 billion U.S. dollars a year. And uh, he told me one day, he said, uh, you know, knowledge used to be power, but knowledge is no longer power anymore because all the knowledge is available to anybody who wants to have the knowledge. So he said, let me tell you what's important. Flawless execution is the big competitive advantage. And he said, the more people who have access to all the information, the more likely you are to have flawless execution. Because in business, we've been taught Keep your cards close to your vest. Don't let the little people know we're doing well because they might want more money. We're going to operate on a need-to-know basis. Well, high-speed companies 
throw that tired old wisdom out the door and everybody has access to all the information. And finally, speed uh, is about having clear, measurable objectives with the resources to fulfill them and an agreed timeline. And so if you can imagine, just for a moment, Gobin, if you put those things together, a single big purpose or destination, everybody aligned around that purpose, everybody with access to all the information to get the job done, and clear, measurable, agreed objectives with the resources to fulfill them, the company is going to be naturally faster than their competitors or anyone else in the marketplace. So are you saying that big and small companies in that sense are not different because if both are large companies at a particular disadvantage here? Voila, voila. Uh, that is exactly what I'm saying. Let me again buck conventional wisdom. The rules are the same for small companies as they are for large companies. See, the reality is any size company can be fast. But sadly, here's what happens in large companies. They become burdened by the following things. They become burdened by hierarchy, silos, secrets, self-importance, and everybody is out looking out for themselves. Now, there are some companies today, some large companies, that I think are doing speed very well. Uh, I think IKEA, the world's only global furniture brand, does speed very well. I think Apple does speed very well. I believe that Microsoft, under the tutelage of its new CEO, is doing speed better than it's ever done it. Salesforce, Netflix, Airbnb, Android, Facebook, Alibaba, they are all, they've all become large companies that are doing speed very well because what they have held on to is that single purpose, alignment around that purpose, everybody having all the information they need, and clear, measurable objectives with the resources to fulfill them. And that's what large companies have to adopt if, if they're going to remain relevant. Right. And, and it's interesting, you mentioned Microsoft, whose purpose or mission used to be putting uh, Microsoft software into every computer on every desk in the world, to now Satya Nadella saying that develop technology to help live better lives. And, and that's exactly what it is. And what an incredible, what an incredible evolution of purpose. And witness the result that, that, he's, that your fellow countryman is achieving. Right. So it, it, it also means that uh, a set of principles or guiding principles may not be permanent and you have to be evolving. But the question then, I guess, is uh, could you be evolving too soon? Are you getting trapped by short term targets or objectives, markets, quarterly results? Yeah, I don't know. Let me let me hold that thought for a moment, because I think uh, in the case of Microsoft, the purpose uh, has evolved because of the maturity of the industry. But our research has actually led us to believe and conclude that seldom does the purpose change. It might evolve, but that the one thing that doesn't change are the guiding principles of an organization. Through our study of uh, 220 of the most, 1,000 of the most successful companies in the world, we have historically found that their guiding principles don't change. In fact, what, what, what the guiding principles of an organization are, are the four, five, or six things that they believe in uh, by which all decisions are going to be made and that they move down throughout the organization because in fast organizations, decision-making doesn't have to come from the top. It can come from even the bottom of the organization, but that can only happen I mean, imagine if everybody was in an organization the size of Microsoft was making whatever decision they wanted to make. I mean, there have to be guidelines. And those become, just like every world's great religion has, has, has a set of guiding principles, uh, so does every great company. So we don't find the guiding principles changing. In fact, I think of many high-speed companies where they have a rule where they don't have any sit-down meetings. Uh, they they believe that when they call a meeting and everybody is sitting down and everybody brings in their PowerPoint presentation and everybody brings in their briefing papers, then everybody feels they have to have voice and everybody has to talk and nothing gets done. In truly high-speed companies, we discovered that most meetings are held standing up. Uh, they last four or five or six minutes, and uh, there's only one question uh, to be answered. And the question is, uh, does it fit our guiding principles? If it fits our guiding principles, let's do it. We're not going to be criticized. If it doesn't fit our guiding principles, uh, let's not do it because we will be criticized. So uh, I believe the purposes 
can sometimes evolve, I have historically found that the guiding principles by which decisions are made haven't changed. But I will tell you this. Uh, the reason that large companies do s- start to slow down almost inevitably uh, is because they they start to believe that because they've been successful, they will always be successful. Now, now consider that for a moment. Uh, they start to believe their own press clippings. And when a company starts to believe their own press clippings, inevitably the seeds of their destruction has already been planted. I, I remember saying in New Zealand on a research trip years and years ago, Uh, on a sign behind the desk of a very highly successful CEO. He said, uh, and the sign said, arrogance and complacency are the scourges of market leadership. And in India, you've got a very good example. I'm I'm not sure of your age, but when you graduated university, I mean, uh, I don't know, did you get an HMT watch? I mean, uh, I know, I know, I know, I, I, I have lots of friends from India. I mean, that was the real sign of accomplishment. They graduated university, and there was that wonderful HMT watch. In fact, uh, I, I believe, uh, I, I think I was already visiting India when HMT said, we are the timekeepers to the nation. Yes. We are the timekeepers of the nation. Well, a little thing like Titan came along, and, well, what happened to HMT? Well, they had started to believe their own press clippings, and uh, it was the scourge of market leadership. Right. So would you say that conversely, uh, you know, companies, if they lack the guiding principles or have failed or slowed down or even disintegrated because they did not pay attention to their own guiding principles? Yeah, I, 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 think, I, I think the list is six things that, uh, that occur to mature companies. One, it's, uh, it's arrogance. Two, complacency. Three, it's entitlement. Four, it's they've become siloed. Five, they have lost their sense of purpose. And finally, they either never had a set of guiding principles or only the top leadership knew the guiding principles. Everybody else in the company was not empowered to act on the guiding principles. And when any of those six things happen, I think the nails are already being placed in the coffin. You've quoted the example of Kodak in your book and Bill Zollers, the CEO, who seemed, as I understood, to recognize the problems. And you've called it the law of suckage, uh, the problems with the company and uh, the challenges it was facing. And yet he could not in time stop the stop the deterioration or the slide. And Kodak obviously uh, is, is, a, is one of the best known examples of implosion. So uh, it, yeah. it was, and and we have to remember that uh, that Bill Zollers wanted nothing more than to become the CEO of Kodak, and he knew what was going on with Kodak, and he saw that the seeds of their own destruction had been sown, and it became obvious that they were going to make another choice for CEO. That's when he actually left and accepted a, a CEO position at another company uh, called Yellow Freight, which is a, a huge transport company in America. But you, you briefly mentioned the law of suckage, and I'd like to share that with your listeners. And, and we came up with that for my last book, actually, myself and my research teams. And the law of suckage basically says, by the time you figure out you suck, you've sucked for a long, long, long time. And if it took you a long time to get there, it's going to take you a long time to write the ship. Remember, Kodak, uh, mo- most people, I, I just used this in a speech last week, and it amazes me the number of people who don't know this. Kodak invented digital photography, and, and, and mm. most of the world doesn't know that. But the amazing thing is, why didn't, why didn't they move with digital photography? Because they were afraid it would harm their traditional film business. Obviously, they knew very little about reinvention. Right, and 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 I'm assuming the the turf battles were so high, or so severe that it ensured that that whole innovation was killed within the company. And that's exactly what happened in the case of Kodak, and so many more whose bones uh, bleached the graveyards of, of failed enterprises. Right. So if if you were to look at uh, one of the things I uh, very interesting things I noticed in that book is that of the two hundred twenty thousand companies that you surveyed. You, you felt that only about two dozen companies actually had uh, complete alignment in terms of principles across the, across the company, across all its employees. Um, very, very few. And again, let me go back to maybe it was a throwaway line uh, that I used at the, at the beginning of our discussion. And that is this. There was a period of time about uh, 20 or 25 years ago in business. And, and this actually, uh, the U.S. led the way in this. 
And uh, uh, the determination was made that every company had to have a vision statement and a mission statement. And so there were there were hundreds of thousands of offsite weekend retreats. There was generally wine and beer and liquor involved, and uh, and people would write uh, the best minds in the company would write together and and, and write this vision statement uh, and write this uh, mission statement, and they would come back to the company and they'd post it in re- in reception. They'd send out a memo, and uh, b- but nothing else happened. And uh, we, I, myself and my teams have done vision audits in most companies. And when you ask most employees in most companies to recite the vision of the company, they just roll their eyes back. And I mean, they, they don't even know what it is. So the difference is, um, is, is purpose. And, and what is a purpose? A, pur- a purpose is the real reason for the existence of the organization. I, I invoked IKEA a few minutes ago. Uh, IKEA, the world's only global furniture brand, said, we exist to improve the lives of the many. I I remember Ingvar Kamprad, their CEO, telling me on many occasions, I mean, we don't sell furniture to the wealthy. I mean, if they want to stop at our store and shop, that's fine if, if, if we're particularly in vogue. But I mean, we exist to improve the lives of the many. And he said, furniture is only the vehicle that we use to do that. And so truly great companies have this, not a vision, but they have this, this, this purpose. And it's always a purpose about making something better uh, for their customers, improving the lot in life of their customers. And when a company has a purpose, they are far ahead of their competitors. And when they don't have a purpose, they're just jumping from tactic to tactic and uh, trying the best idea that comes along at the moment. You know, uh, one of the f- big fears today is that you will there will be a company like Uber that will come out of nowhere and eat uh, eat my lunch. Now, if you are strong on your guiding principles, but and yet you may be in a business or a space that could get cannibalized thanks to technology, thanks to connectivity, and so on. So, h- how do you reconcile the two? I mean, the kind of competition and threat that might come versus your own maybe strong vision or strong focus on principles? So um, I believe that we have probably just scratched the surface of what we're going to see. I I get to spend a lot of time every year on the campus of Microsoft, on the campus of Intel, uh, at companies like Salesforce, just observing to see what the future holds. And if anybody thinks that in this gigantic IT journey and AI journey that we're in, if anybody thinks that we're beyond the first, the first mile marker of a long journey, we're not. We're, we're not there now. And so I believe that every single industry is extraordinarily vulnerable and it can happen overnight. I mean, take a look at, uh, at what Netflix did. Take a look at what Uber did. Take a care, uh, take a look at what, uh, 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 Airbnb has done. Uh, take a look at what Android has done. Take a look at what Apple has done. The list is a long one. Any single, any industry is uh, vulnerable to being disintermediated. And what I found, and I will again, I might be a little repetitive, but I'll add a couple of new things in too. I mean, if you're going to continue to, to be relevant, if you're going to continue to prosper, number one, you have to have this single sense of purpose. You have to have alignment around that. Everybody has to have access to all the information. You've got to have these clear, measurable objectives with resources to fulfill them. The organization has to be willing to make lots of small bets, lots of small bets, and then scale what works and move on from what doesn't. And they also have to know, and here's a big one, uh, and this one is actually, I think, worth a lot of money, and it's knowing that perfect is the enemy of good. And I think that actually sometimes comes in conflict uh, with Indian companies. Uh, there is so, there's, there's, there's so much importance attached in the educational system in India uh, to being perfect students and, and perfect owners of the knowledge that, that sometimes I feel that, that you, it's hard for a lot of populations to get their head around the fact that perfect is the enemy of good. And so you've got to make all of these small bets. And if something looks like it's going to take off, you've got to run with it 
and you've got to implement it, and you've got to do it on the fly. You, you, you just have to move quickly. Uh, what's dangerous is when a company has become large and old and tired and is verging on irrelevance, and what do they do? They very often think they've got to make one big bet. Well, that's not a very good bet to make. When you're standing on the edge of a cliff, peering over <laughs> into the abyss, and you're going to, pardon me for mixing my metaphors, and you're going to bet the ranch on one big bet, the odds are decidedly not in your favor. And so one of the other things we find in all of these companies is they are constantly making lots and lots and lots of small bets. Probably the best example is when Howard Schultz came back and took over as CEO again of Starbucks. He gathered 10,000 Starbucks employees in New Orleans uh, to build uh, homes for victims of Katrina. He addressed them one night and he said, look, I want to personally apologize to you for how Starbucks has let you down. He said, uh, we were never going to be defined as a coffee shop. We allowed ourselves to be defined that way. He said, I'm back. He said, our whole purpose for existence was to improve the lives of our customers, to improve the lives of everybody that worked with us, and we let you down. In order to be in a position where we can be that company again, we're going to make a gigantic number of small bets. And those that scale, I mean, we run with. Those that don't, we move on. And in an 18-month period of time, Starbucks made 140 small bets from moving into a dessert line to getting into the tea business, um, uh, to moving into food products, to redesigning stores, to testing wine and beer. And, and, and look what happened. Uh, he, the company had shrunk from 13,000 worldwide locations to 9,000. When Howard Schultz came back and embarked on this policy of making lots of small bets, the company grew again to 25,000 stores, $25 billion in annual revenues, and introduced like one of their small bets – well, I'm not sure if it's a food stuff in, in uh, India. I've, I've never actually, I always have uh, masala dosa for breakfast. I never have oatmeal. Uh, but take a look at oatmeal. It was a small little bet. And we believe that oatmeal probably makes up about $600 million a year in revenue with almost all of that falling to the bottom line for Starbucks, all because of one small bet. So we can't underestimate the importance of making lots and lots of small bets. Making lots of small bets prevents you from being in a place where you've got to make one big risk it all bet which is tantamount to gambling last question for this segment uh, jason so what you said also leads to another uh, point and the title of another book of yours called the reinventors and how extraordinary companies pursue radical continuous change so what are the best examples here i mean if i were to ask you or request you to sum it up well i i i think for this segment i, I think the best way to answer that is this uh rather than get into specific names it would be to say this um uh, you have to understand that reinvention is never about uh, it, it's it's never about a process. It's never about a thing we're going to do. It's never going to be a corporate undertaking. It's not going to be a project. It's not going to be a design. Great companies understand that they have to be reinventing all the time, nonstop. So reinvention is actually, and I know this is out there in the ether a little bit, and I apologize for that. Maybe we can more fully explore that in segment two. But reinvention actually must become a mindset. It must become the culture of the organization. And what I find today is this, that truly great companies get it. They understand that they are training people for jobs and for work and for projects today that in a few years will be completely irrelevant and they're going to have to let that go and move on to something else. So the thought I would like to leave you with in this segment is that reinvention, until it becomes the culture, uh, until it becomes the state of mind, until it becomes the essence for the, for, for the existence of the organization, it will just always be viewed as a, as a project or something to be dealt with. And that's not what we found in, in, in truly great high-speed companies that are constantly reinventing themselves. Right. Jason, thank you very much. And we're going to be back with another segment with Jason Jennings and talk about building a high-speed company, essentially introducing some of the toolkits that you need to build a high-speed organization, whether you're a small one or a big one. Thank you. 
Don't forget to tune in on bloombergquint.com or IBM podcast app for the latest edition of business.next podcast every week. Hi, my name is Anupam Gupta. I'm B50 on Twitter. I am the host of Paisa Paisa, a show that talks money. On my show, I speak to experts from every field of money and finance, from stock markets, equities, debt funds, credit cards, life insurance, every possible area of money and finance that you can think of. We even did an episode on cryptocurrency. I've got fantastic guests from mutual funds to personal finance experts everywhere. Robo advisory, startups, just name it, we've got it. At Pesa Pesa, we help you make smart decisions about money. You work hard for money. Now make your money work hard for you. New episodes out every Monday and you can listen to my show on the IVM podcast app or any other podcasting app that you have. Did you know that Parsis in Mumbai instead of being left at the tower of silence after they die are now cremated? And why because a cow fell sick in the early 1990s? Did you know that the smog in Delhi is caused by something that farmers in Punjab do and that there's no way to stop them? Did you know that there wasn't one gas tragedy in Bhopal but 3? One of them was seen but two were unseen. Did you know that many well-intentioned government policies hurt the people they're supposed to help? Why was demonetization a bad idea? How should GST have been implemented? Why are all our politicians so corrupt when not all of them are bad people? I'm Amit Verma and in my weekly podcast The Seen and the Unseen I take a shot at answering all these questions and many more I aim to go beyond the scene and show you the unseen effects of public policy and private action I speak to experts on economics political philosophy cognitive neuroscience and constitutional law so that the insights can blow not only my mind but also yours The Seen and the Unseen releases every Monday so do check out the archives and follow the show at seenunseen.in you can also subscribe to The Seen and the Unseen on whatever podcast app you happen to prefer